Hi everyone, welcome back to the channel and thanks for tuning in for today's video. The topic of today's video is the problem with burnout. Now, I'm betting a few of you watching this likely had a reaction to me saying the word burnout without even knowing what I have to say on the matter. If that's you, you're in the right place. Now, before getting into the issues with burnout as it pertains to mental health, finding an operative definition is likely going to be helpful here for us. And so uh, one operational definition of burnout I like to use is from a 2018 article by Patel R named Factors Related to Physician Burnout and Its Consequences, a Review. In this article, Patel uses an operational definition of burnout, calling it a psychological syndrome characterized by emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, and a sense of reduced accomplishment in day-to-day -day work where emotional exhaustion refers to feelings of being overextended and the depletion of one's emotional and physical resources. Patel goes on to say that this can sometimes lead to negative, cynical, hostile attitudes and detached feelings towards patients known as depersonalization. Now, while Patel's paper focuses on the impacts of burnout on physicians, you don't need to be a physician to know what burnout is or what it feels like. If you simply replace the word patients with customers, vendors, colleagues, etc., you get a sense of how this can look like in your daily life. Now that we've got some common language to work from, we're going to briefly review some stats related to burnout that will hopefully shed some light on how big our problem this really is. So according to an article published by Jack Flynn of Zipia.com, 89% of Americans have suffered from burnout in the past year, experiencing a range of symptoms such as physical fatigue at 44% of respondents, cognitive wariness at 36% of respondents, emotional exhaustion at 32%, lack of interest, motivation, or energy at 26%, and lack of effort at work at 19% of respondents. Suspected causes of burnouts were identified as heavy workloads, lack of control, lack of support, and lack of resources. For those interested in some of these stats, I highly recommend reading the Zipia article as I've only scratched the surface on what it has to say on the matter. So what's clear about these survey results is that the issue of burnout is likely far higher than what we may have suspected, and with burnout this high, you may be curious uh, what's being done about it. The answer, according to that previous Zibia survey, is largely the same thing we've been doing that led to it in the first place. Many watching this video know one word that's typically used in any discussion relating to burnout, and that is self-care. Uh, now just to preface what we're going to talk about, this video is not a video that's intended to trash self-care practices or diminish their value in recovery from burnout, vicarious trauma, compassion fatigue, or as part of a routine mental health maintenance practice. What I will say is that when employees are struggling with burnout, many often won't come forward to talk about it because the first response to them is going to include some variation of the question, what have you been doing to take care of yourself outside of work? Other responses can just remind employees to stay on top of their self-care practices or tell them to simply take time off of work. I remember one instance in my clinical career where an organization paid for me to go to a lecture on burnout and vicarious trauma because they legitimately thought it would be helpful, and most of us were hoping it would be. Uh, but it essentially resulted in a couple hundred of us clinicians being told that we were the cause of our own exhaustion. And that's the kicker here. When we talk about burnout, the knee-jerk reactions of organizations are often to penalize the person coming forward to discuss it by placing the onus of how we're feeling squarely on us instead of asking questions that could be more helpful like what is it about our organizational structure or way of working that is chronically compromising the majority of our staff. Placing the onus of burnout squarely on employees is an incredibly dishonest tactic that employers have used for quite some time and its roots go back to the in the 70s where the term was first applied to work settings by New York psychologist Herbert Freudenberger. So according to uh, the Washington Post, Freudenberger popularized the term burnout with respect to his clinical practice when he published a paper titled 
staff burnout in 1974. Freudenberger postulated that those who were prone to burnout were the dedicated and committed, further commenting that it is precisely because we are dedicated that we walk into a burnout trap. We work too long and too intensely. We feel a pressure from within to work and help, and we feel a pressure from the outside to give. Many organizations know this about the human condition, and they've gone ahead and weaponized it to exploit the maximum amount of labor possible from their workers. So all of this may feel like it's taken the wind out of your sails, and I imagine the next question would be, well, what now? Well, I'd like to offer a perspective that may be helpful and may not be. You, you, know, you can decide. Um, if we're aware of how the landscape is going to look for the vast majority of us with respect to our employers, instead of deflating us, it can empower us. Now, we're going to find some common language here again to go and discuss some of our options to make sure we're on the same page. So, uh, without any further ado, here's option one, quiet quitting. Despite the media frenzy and misinformation surrounding what quiet quitting is, the actual term was first uh, you know, brought up by Brian Creeley in March 2022, where he described the practice as doing the bare minimum explaining that it's not outright quitting your job, but quitting the idea of going above and beyond. You're still performing your duties, but you're no longer subscribing to the hustle culture mentality that work has to be your life. So when might this approach be appropriate? That's gonna depend on your circumstances. Some questions I might consider to aid in coming to an answer, uh, you know, are, is this a company that is largely expecting you to work outside of your regularly scheduled business hours? Uh, have supervisors, managers, or team leaders supported your professional goals within the organization? Uh, would you like a promotion to another role in the org? And what are the potential consequences of quiet quitting within this role? Uh, I'm especially attuned to the answer of the last question because if a company regularly requires its employees to go above and beyond to accomplish basic employment tasks set forth, then that employee's position likely requires two people where the company only hired one, making quiet quitting all but impossible. Option two, employment reclamation. This option is about reclaiming the reasons why you have chosen to work specifically where you do. This in itself won't address an organization's poor response to burnout, but it can help provide us with a framework to manage our own expectations from uh, our organizations and ourselves. Uh, employment reclamation is about first examining the set of reasons why you chose to work where you do outside of the basic necessities of money. In reclaiming employment, we can begin not only trying to figure the ins and outs of our own positions, but also develop new skills that our organizations are uniquely qualified to offer us. Uh, for example, one position you may have at work could have you simply performing administrative duties with no opportunities for advancement, while a similar position could have you performing the same function, but with the opportunity to also dip into other functions such as training, uh, team management, etc. In employment reclamation, you're turning the tables on the employer-employee relationship and assessing all resources your organization can offer you to aid in career advancement and professional development. In a sense, you're extracting from the company what you need in order to ready yourself for promotion or the acquisition of new job skills that are required for other positions outside of the organization that will more fairly compensate you for those skills. So option three, change nothing. So uh, it goes to say that sometimes the best option to tend to burnout is just to go with the flow. If you don't have the physical or emotional capacity to do something different, then don't. If the previous two list items are illuminating anything, it's that while organizations can stand to improve their support of employees who are experiencing burnout, we can also work to be compassionate about our own circumstances and not challenge ourselves to perform more emotional labor about how we're gonna make ourselves feel better this time around. 
Sometimes doing nothing to address temporary, single, or chronic states of burnout can be helpful as we allow ourselves the commodity of time that's necessary for us to be in our feelings and move through states of intense discomfort. Option four, quit. Our final option that we have is simply to quit. Leaving a position is often an incredibly difficult choice to make, but for some, it's the only option available after chronic burnout and exhaustion take their hold. While I would strongly recommend a gap of time between the end of your last position and the start of your new one, I recognize that not everyone, especially now, is in a position to make that happen. My one hope is that anyone considering quitting their position can internalize that their reason for quitting doesn't have to be valid to everyone, and it doesn't have to make sense, and it doesn't have to be something that your employers are going to like because ultimately it's likely the most helpful option at times for ourselves and them. Quitting can be the ultimate feedback to employers that what they're doing to maintain the well-being of their employees or not simply isn't working, and that something else is now required. Whether employers choose to take that feedback up will be up to them, but you can leave a position knowing that your actions cater to your needs and humanity in a way that many organizations fail to. I hope the information in this video has been helpful, and if you've enjoyed this content, feel free to like and subscribe for future video drops and updates. Thank you for joining me today, and I look forward to seeing you next time.